t today I'm going to be talking about Satan. I just thought it was interesting. I was having a conversation with somebody and, um, you know, we got talking on Satan and there was just so many just misconceptions about Satan, who he is, where he came from. And I don't really know how much you guys know, uh, but when you start actually looking into the Bible and learning about Satan, you realize there's actually a lot said about Satan in the Bible. Um, so it's not a small topic, but I'll, I'll go through everything that I know about Satan. It's, it's, and it's not really going to, I don't really have a logical flow going through this. I tried to, but I've just sort of put everything I know in here and we'll just go through it. And hopefully a lot of it will be new to you or interesting to you, at least as you learn about uh, Satan and the, the capabilities that he has and where he comes from. So maybe, maybe it'll undo some misconceptions that you have about Satan uh, as well. Now, in the Bible, there, there, there is a spiritual realm. Like a lot of people think that, you know, uh, demon possession just doesn't really happen, uh, you know, that ghosts are not real and all that sort of stuff. And, and ghosts are not real in the sense that there are actually dead people just floating around like in Casper or whatnot. But there, 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 there are demons around, there are devils around, you know, pretending to be ghosts, right? They're deceiving people because if a, if a devil can think that your loved one is still alive, sort of haunting this house, then, then you're going to think that there's no hell, right? You're not going to think that, that the person who's died that didn't believe on Jesus Christ is actually in hell or in heaven. So they do things like this. They can fake things. They can fake, um, you know, like possessions. They can fake casting out. They can fake all these things to make people believe. And that's why they can do miracles and all that sort of stuff. I remember talking to a friend's father when I was in high school and uh, he used to do martial arts and he would tell me, uh, and at the time I, I didn't really know much about the spiritual realm and about Satan and whatnot. And I remember sitting in their living room and he was telling me about these martial arts that he would learn. And he says, when you start getting really, really into martial arts, you start learning the dark arts. And the dark arts was nothing more than just demon possession, right? And, and that's another thing. People that sort of delve into the occult and whatnot, it's almost like they, they, they are led to believe that they have power over these demons, but then really it's the demons have power over them. And people that are delving into the occult and they play around with demons, they end up being scared of leaving that because, you know, what the demons will do to them and whatnot. So anyways, before I get on to another story, but... Uh, I, was, I, was in the, I was in the I was in the living room we were talking about he, 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 t he told me about the dark arts and he was saying that like when you start getting really into martial arts it's no longer about the artistic form it's not about like how hard you can kick and punch but it's just like these these crazy things that they can do and it really it's just demon possession and he was talking about this hierarchy and you know the, if you are possessed by a, a demon that is higher up in the hierarchy then you can pretty much command the demons that are under it and he said he saw all this weird stuff and he said he was so glad that he got out of it, but he saw some really weird things where people could just like, you know, just fully just get a machete and just like cut themselves on the arm and they wouldn't bleed. He's seen people levitate and things like that. And, and you know, you hear things like that and, and your first thought as somebody that lives in the Western world is just like, is this stuff really for real? But, you know, when you read through the Bible and you read about demon possession and you read about the spiritual realm, you can't deny that this stuff happens out there. Um, a church that I was going to in Perth, the, the bishop there, he had seen people actually uh, like, like shapeshift where they, they, their, their body, they could, they, because they were possessed by a demon, they would actually change shape. And he's seen like people like sort of like uh, do all this weird stuff. He was describing it to me. And there was even a lady in the church there that was heavily in the occult. Um, and for her, the way she described it is as, you know, you start delving into the occult because you're curious. And then it's a bit like the mafia in the sense that you get in too deep and you're scared to leave. And sometimes people that are really deep in the occult, they look like they're all in, in control and everything like that, but they're actually scared. They're actually scared to stop serving the demons because of what the demons are threatening them with. And for her, it wasn't until she realized that Jesus was Lord of the demons, that she felt safe to go to Jesus because Jesus, she realized, was, was Lord. You know, like if you remember in the, in the passages where the, the demon-possessed man went, went and went to Jesus and, and said, torment me not. So they're actually scared of Jesus. So for them, it's almost like them realizing that they have somewhere to go to, right? Because it's like the mafia. If you don't have protection, 
you know, if you try and run, they're going to come after you. So it's a bit like that. So it's just these, these interesting stories. Um, but definitely there is a satanic realm. There is a spiritual realm. And you often wonder, you know, why is it that we in the Western world, we don't see things like this? And, and I, I can't really prove this, but a, a theory out there is that because we live in a world where we are so distracted with the physical world, so distracted with riches, Satan already has us chasing the thorns of this world. He already has us distracted to the point where people are not religious anymore. People are not spiritual anymore. So why would he want to manifest these things to deceive people, to scare people into believing, you know, following these pagan witch doctors and all that sort of stuff when we're already so non-religious as a Western society, it'll just wake people up to the spiritual realm. And that's why when you think of places like in Mexico, my wife will tell you of freaky things that her mom has seen and over there because they're all into the paganism and things like that. They say that they worship the queen of heaven and then they'll bless her. You know, you'll be looking out on the street, they'll be blessing a new shop and there's literally like a witch doctor in a skull mask just like scaring the kids and they think this is of God. I just, it's crazy. So that's probably why we don't see a lot of this. But... That doesn't mean we should be ignorant of it. So this is, uh, this is what we're going to be talking about, a couple of things. You know, where did Satan come from? You can read through this. You know, you've probably been reading through this as I've been talking. Uh, you know, what else can Satan do, what he can't do? And we'll kind of end on, you know, why was Satan created and why is he even allowed to exist? Just some, some, some reasoning there. I, I won't definitely get through all the scriptures. I'm just probably going to get through about half of this and then we'll, um, we'll stop it there and then we'll continue next week. So let's talk about first about like where did Satan come from? Now, before we go to the first mention of Satan in Genesis, obviously, where we see the introduction of Satan, uh, we see that uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, we'll just read here, it says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So I just thought before we go to Genesis, where we look at how Eve was beguiled by the serpent, it's good here because when we are going to get tricked, or somebody's going to deceive us into believing another gospel, it's going to be similar to the way that Eve was deceived in the garden, right? Because he says here, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And 2 Corinthians 2.11 says here, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Paul writing says he doesn't want to be, us to be ignorant of how Satan operates and who he is and what he does. So it's good for us to learn about him so that we are not ignorant, like the Bible says, of his devices. We don't want to be, and we shouldn't be. That's why Paul says we are not ignorant of his devices, because so much is said in the Bible of how Satan operates. You just have to read the Bible to, to learn a lot about Satan. So in Genesis 3, let's go back to the beginning. It says here, now the serpent was more subtle. So we see here that this, this, this serpent, and we know later on, and we'll look at Revelation, that this serpent was actually Satan. Now was Satan possessing this serpent or is he just described as a as a serpent uh, obviously there are different views there uh, i personally think he had just you know sort of demon possessed this serpent and was taking on the form of a serpent at the time but uh, who knows there are there are different views there now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the lord god hath made and he said unto the woman yea hath god said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden so you remember in the beginning god created adam and eve that he said don't eat of the the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good good and evil which is in the midst of the garden now the first thing that satan does when he comes to eve you see he says yea hath god said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden so the first thing that satan does to beguile you know, and, and to, to trick people into believing something else, is he first questions what God clearly said. 
right? So you see he's asking a question. He says, yea, hath God said. So we have the sure word of God, the sure prophecy. We have the words of God. But now you've got all these different Bible versions coming in, people going back to the Greek to try and explain their position. I remember when I was in the Bible Presbyterian Church and I was showing people clear scriptures about, like the Bible doesn't say repent of your sins and all this. And then a preacher came in and he started going back to the Greek and going. So it's, it's almost like you have the clear statements in the Bible. You have the clear scripture, but then this satanic influence of just questioning is that really what god said is that the sure word of god i mean there's all these different translations they all say different things that's this satanic spirit that is coming into the church and just confusing people and 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 taking away the foundation so this is satan's tactic right one is he questions god's word with the clear statement that he said he with the day you eat thereof you shall surely die but he's saying hey hath god said question mark and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. So that is what God said. But look at what else Eve says. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So not only is Eve now adding to God's word, but she's probably adding to God's word. Why? Because she doesn't know God's word very well. Right, because God's word was clear. Just don't eat of the tree of the garden. She's probably just thinking, "Oh yeah, I, I knew it was familiar. You know, I heard that preached in church or whatnot. You know, that would be the modern day application." Like I heard Victor talking about it, but then because you don't know it very well, you start either adding to it or you start, you know, uh, getting it wrong. Right? You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest she die. So this is why she was easily deceived right maybe she uh, she 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 wasn't really remembering or she didn't know very well what god had said and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die so he gets eve to question god's word eve didn't recount the word that well she didn't know it that well and then now he's just blatantly denying he's just going against god's word so we know that god's word says for by grace are you saved through faith and now they're preaching that salvation's by works, is from turning from your sin. Uh, you know, you can just see that in a lot of false doctrine there, that you have the clear scripture, they make you question the scripture, and then they just fully just turn it on its head to something that it's not. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's, knowing good and evil. So now he's like promising something. Yeah, sure, their eyes were open, we read later on. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So he promises them something, that their eyes will be open. So you see how he tempts them with something new, something to be curious about. And he's partly true because their eyes will be open. But when they ate, their eyes were open to sin, right? Their eyes were open to disobedience. Their eyes were open to, to being disfellowshipped and outside of the garden of God. They bit, I guess, they, like they say, they bit off more than they could chew. Now, one thing I want to note here as well, I, know, I don't know if it's the Catholic position the official catholic position but some people believe that this fruit in the garden was just uh sort of analogous to the the act between a man and a woman right and and sort of saying this is i think it's this catholic mentality that you know that sex is taboo and it's something that is 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 totally foreign to god and it was evil and you know god created adam and eve and you know this fruit was just analogous for them sleeping together but god didn't want them to sleep together or something like that and obviously you, you just have to read through genesis to see this was false right he obviously brought the woman to the man and 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 they knew each other and they had children and things like that so this fruit is is not some forbidden fruit of of um, of sleeping with a woman or sleeping with a man you know that's something that's created by god it's a beautiful thing and it's between a man and a wife um, within marriage no this is actually a literal fruit this was a tree in the garden it was a literal fruit that they were tempted to eat um, and that their eyes would be open but obviously it opened it to the wrong thing and they heard the voice of the lord god walking in the garden in the cool of the day so i always think that's interesting that that's i believe that's jesus christ you know walking in the cool of the day the, the voice of the lord the word of god is actually walking in the garden isn't that interesting and adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the lord 
uh, Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God said unto Adam and said, Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So he's blaming his wife. Verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So now she's blaming the serpent for her sin. And I'm reading this just to get to verse 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Genesis 3.15 And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is interesting because this is a prophetic statement talking about Jesus Christ who would one day destroy Satan, right? So that he would bruise his heel. So I believe that's referring to the crucifixion, right? Where Jesus would be beaten and bruised and he would die and rise again, but ultimately he would bruise his head. He would overcome Satan and, and destroy him as we read in the last days. So I hope to get to that passage, but just keep that in mind because I want to um, go into to Revelation and just talk a bit about Revelation 12. But before we go into that in depth, we see here that that serpent is actually Satan. And we see here in Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 20, and he had laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I remember watching this cartoon on YouTube, and uh, it, was, it was recounting the story in, um, in Genesis, and it was talking about this serpent that came along and beguiled Eve. And for some reason, this cartoon just didn't want to state the fact that that serpent was Satan. It just said, oh, it was just this unknown figure in the garden just coming and tempting Eve. And I, I, sometimes I just get so disappointed at these children cartoons where they make this cartoon to teach people and to teach children, but they just leave out these fundamental truths, just these obvious truths in the Bible. You don't have to guess who that serpent was in the garden. You know, it's not this unknown figure. We don't know who he is. No, it's very clear that that serpent in the garden was Satan, which is devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. Now let's go through Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 is a really interesting passage. It's, it's talking about the prince of Tyrus. And although it's a prophetical book, a prophetical chapter from Ezekiel about an actual king in Tyrus, but it also goes on and, and compares this king of Tyrus to Satan. And I'll explain why as we go through. But as we start from chapter uh, verse 1, as we read through these different attributes of the king or the prince of Tyrus, we can learn a bit about Satan, right? So verse one, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. And we often think of a prince as like second to the king, but in the Bible, the, the princes are, can often be the king as well. It's just the one that's in charge, right? The, the principal person, if you think about it, the first person is, can be referred to as the princes or the kings. Um, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up. So we see here that what Satan, he obviously he, he started to become proud, didn't he? His heart was lifted up. And we read a lot how he wanted to be like God. And now I said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. So you see here, Satan desires to be like God. He desires to be worshipped. He desires to have that authority, but he, he's not, right? He's just being proud because he's not realizing his place under God. In the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man. So you see how it's going back and forth between the prince of Tyrus and, and Satan. Uh, well, it's talking about the prince of Tyrus. So we see there some allusions to the prince of Tyrus, but we'll see as well later on some allusions to Satan. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. And if you've read the book of Daniel, you see here that Daniel was given a lot of wisdom, a lot of revelations, interpretation of dreams. It's saying here that Satan... He's even wiser than Daniel. So we are, we are not dealing with an enemy that's an idiot. Do you know what I mean? He's very wise. He knows exactly what he's doing. And that's why you don't want to be ignorant of his devices where you just let the world and let Satan's influence in the world just get into you and not be wary of how he operates. 
Thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. He has a lot of wisdom. He, know, he knows a lot of things that we don't know, right? With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten the riches and has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. So you see here, he's very smart. He knows how to make, get people a lot of money. And this is why often you, know, you see the rich people, they're into the occult, the, the, the Hollywood people that are into the, 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 uh, you know, the movies and whatnot. They're all, they're all getting into this satanic influence because he's in these, these upper echelons. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, Right? So the, the, his commerce and what he does, hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. You know, this is why you have to be careful the sort of music that you listen to, the sort of movies you watch, the sort of people you glorify. Yeah, us back in the days, you might have not been saved back then, but now you have to realize that maybe the music you used to listen to and the people you used to like and the movies you used to watch have satanic influence in there and you ought not just glorify them and just absorb everything and just follow them because they are not of God. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. They shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. So ultimately Satan will be destroyed as the prince of Tyrus was. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him thou, that slayeth thee. It's saying like, you know, is Satan going to look at God in the day that he's sent to hell and say that he's God? Of course not. So we know that Satan ultimately loses this battle. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. So again, another prophecy here, as he speaks about this king of Tyrus. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So you see here that Satan not only is very wise, but he's very beautiful. This is why he knows what, what beauty is, and this is why he knows how to portray and sell that beauty. Right? When, we, when, you, when you watch all the movie stars and the music stars and things like that. Thou, and look at this, this is how we know that the king of Tyrus, this prophecy about the king of Tyrus, is also talking about Satan. It's also talking about some spiritual ruler. Because look at what it says in verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden. So you see here, so it's not talking about the king of Tyrus there because the king of Tyrus wasn't in the Garden of Eden, but we know that Satan was in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold. So you see, he's a, very, he's a very beautiful creature. The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So two things there. We see that Satan is a musical creature. This is why he's so active amongst the movie stars and the music stars, right? Because he can use their talent to get out his message through music. He knows music very well. He knows how to use the power of music to teach his message and to influence the masses. That's why people often, they listen to this new music and they listen to it again and again and again. The lyrics are so dark and you're wondering why all these young people are just having mental issues and having like depressed thoughts and thinking of killing themselves when they're listening to these bands that just, you know, are preaching this dark stuff in their mind with all this dark music. So thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So he's a musical creature. But look at this, the day that thou was created. So remember, we're talking about where did Satan come from? Satan was actually created, right? So he's a created being. So a lot of people think of Satan as like this, 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 this anti-God. Like he's like the black God and then God is like the white God. Like in Roman, Roman mythology and Greek mythology, like you have the good and the evil. And, you know, they think, you know, God is all-knowing and he's omniscient and he's ruling in heaven and, and he's eternal. And the same with Satan. Satan's omniscient. He's like, no, 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 no. Satan is not like God. He wants to be like God. He wants to, he, 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 I'm sure he wishes he was eternal and had the power of God and omniscient and omnipresent because then he could influence a lot more people. 
But no, he, he's actually a created being of God. So, right, so God created man, but he also created other creatures as well. He created the angels. And we find out here that Satan also was created, right? He, he was a created creature as well. Thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So you see here that Satan is a cherubim. He's a, he's a type of angelic, uh, he's a type of heavenly creature that's called a cherubim. And he's the cherub that covereth. So I'll show you what's interesting there a bit later, but uh, you know, when, about what it means, the cherub that covereth, or what I believe it means. And I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So he has been in God's presence. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. So you see, like Satan was not created evil, right? Because a lot of people think, well, why did God create Satan? Why did he create this evil person that deceives and does all this terrible stuff? The thing is, Satan was actually created perfect. And like everything else that was created, it was created by him and for him, right? So these creatures are created to serve God, to worship God. Satan as well as a cherubim was created to glorify God and to serve God. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. So he was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, when was the iniquity found, right? We can kind of theorize, well, obviously the iniquity was found in him before man sinned, right? Because the reason why man sinned is because the serpent came and beguiled Eve. So the, the sin of Satan was even before the sin of man. So you have the creation. It's somewhere in, in between there, after the seven days of creation and when man sinned and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of the garden. Why do we know that? Because after God created the world in, seven, in six days and then he rested the seventh day, remember he said he looked at everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Right? So if Satan was rebelling at that time, God's not going to look at his creation, which includes Satan and say, hey, this is very good. So it was after the creation that we believe that you know, Satan, you know, he, he sinned and started rebelling against God and then he went and uh, convinced Eve to sin against God till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. See, look, again, it's just repeating how he's wise, how he's beautiful, how he's just so good at merchandise and all these things. He's got all these riches. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that, thou, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. So we see here that not only is he beautiful, he's wise, he's, he's got riches, he knows how to sell things, but also he's a religious creature as well. He has sanctuaries, right? And this is why a lot of false religions are created by Satan, because he knows, he, he, he knows how religion works. He knows how to get people worshipping something other than God by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more. So see, we see here that one day he will be punished and he will be going to hell just like uh, anybody that does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I kind of alluded to this too. Satan being a cherub. Now, a lot of people think that Satan is an angel. I don't personally believe he's an angel. And the reason why is because generally people think of angels as having wings, don't they? If you remember that movie where it was like uh, John Travolta was playing like the Archangel Michael, right? And remember how he's like trying to wear this big trench coat because he's got like these big eagle's wings on his back. Now, there's nowhere in the Bible that you can find a passage that talks about angels having wings. Right? And the reason why I think people get this idea that angels have wings is because they believe Satan is an angel, that he's a fallen angel, and, he, and he's a cherub, and cherubims have wings. Right? So they just make this connection that Satan is an angel. Now, I don't believe Satan is an angel. I believe he's a cherubim. And the reason why I don't think he's an angel is because the Bible talks a lot about angels, that they're messengers. And um, it says here in Hebrews 13 too, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, like people that come to your house, uh, like maybe missionaries and whatnot in those days, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So he's saying like, hey, there might be these traveling missionaries coming through 
and you just thought they were like these missionaries and you had them in and you gave them something to eat and you gave them a bed to sleep in. And the Bible saying here, you might have actually entertained an angel not even knowing that. Why? Because an angel looks like a man. An angel actually looks like a person. Now, if the angel was like that archangel Gabriel John Travolta with a big trench coat with the big wings, I mean, you're going to know you're entertaining an angel, right? So that's why I don't think Satan is an angel. He's not, he's not a cherubim. Uh, he's, a, he's a cherubim and he has wings, right? Whereas angels do not have wings. Now, Satan has his angels where he has convinced a third of the angels to do his bidding, and those are the demons and the devils that roam around this earth, and they may look like men, right? That's why you might have people that, I don't, I don't know if in this world there are people that we know, like famous movie stars, maybe they are demons, they are angels, because you wouldn't tell the difference, right? Um, but it says here that angels, you can't tell the difference between an angel and a man, but if a man had these huge wings on the back, you would be able to tell the difference. Now, what is this cherubim, that, this cherub, this anointed cherub that covereth? Now, let's read here in Exodus 25. It says, And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. So these are the instructions to Moses to build the, the tabernacle and to build the, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant, which was this big box. Right? If you, if, I don't know if you have ever tried to picture the Ark of the Covenant, maybe Google some images. Uh, basically, it's like this rectangular box that's like, I think it's like two as wide as it is high. So it's kind of like a square on one side and then it's twice as long. And then it has like rings around it, right, on the bottom, bottom of it. And then there's these golden staves that go through those rings. So you can imagine the way like the Catholics kind of, you know, carry their female statue around and there's rings going through the platform. That's sort of how they would carry that around. They would put the, the staves in it and, and then the, uh, the priest would, uh, the, the, the Levites would carry it around. Now, on top of this Ark of the Covenant, there was the mercy seat, right? And this represented where God dwelt, where he sat. And on either side of this, it says here, so they're making this mercy seat, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half. So this is the mercy seat that's sitting on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 18, And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So on either side of this mercy seat, what Moses was commanded to make was to make these golden cherubims, right? These, these, uh, these heavenly creatures where their wings, it says here, make one cherubim on one end and the other cherubim on the other end, even of the mercy seat, shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. Look at this in verse 20. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to the other, one to another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. Now, a couple of things here. Some people believe that just making like a molten image of something is idolatry. I don't believe that's the case. I believe idolatry is when you make the molten or graven image and then you bow down to it. So I don't think it's necessarily a sin to have like, you know, figurines of animals or things like that in your house. But it's definitely wrong to bow down and worship them. Now, I think when you have like, say, a statue that you bought on your trip to India, and it's like that black elephant, and you know that's a statue that they worship, I think that's an issue of the conscience in the sense that do I want what I know and recognize as an idol in my house? Of course I wouldn't, right? So that's why you might not want, you won't want those things in your house. That's, that's my opinion. But is it wrong for somebody to have a black elephant statue, right? It's not necessarily a sin in and of itself. So that, that's my position on sort of, uh, you know, creating you know, molten images or whatnot, that it's not a sin necessary to make a figurine. And even if it looks similar to something else, you know, that's an issue of the conscience. But once a person actually believes it has power and bow down and worship it, worships it, that's the sin that the Bible is talking about. And you'll see throughout the Bible, every time it talks about making a molten image, it also talks about bowing down and worshiping it. Now, why do I say it's not wrong necessarily to make a figure of something in the earth or in heaven? Well, because God actually commanded, you know, Moses to make two cherubims of gold. Now, if it was wrong to make a molten image of a creature in heaven or in earth, how can God tell Moses, hey, you're going to make two cherubims of gold and put it on this mercy seat? Again, Solomon put, you know, things throughout his temple as well. And also even Moses, remember he was told to make the brazen serpent. 
So not, not wrong there to necessarily make a molten or a graven image of something in heaven or in earth, but the sin is to bow down to it. So if you can see this picture here, there's that box and then there's the mercy seat on top and then on either side of the mercy seat, there's a cherubim, right, that has his wings covering the mercy seat. Now what I think is interesting is that the, the Ark of the Covenant, that was a picture of what is actually in heaven, right? There's actually, an, uh, you know, the mercy seat in heaven where God dwells. And the reason why there's two cherubims of gold on either side of the Ark of this Covenant is because in heaven there are two cherubims on either side of God's seat covering the mercy seat. So isn't that interesting? So I think the reason why Satan was so close to God is because he was one of those two cherubims. He was one of the two cherubims that was chosen to be on either side of the mercy seat and cover um, that mercy seat. The cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. So, you know, is this why a lot of people believe that, you know, Satan wanted to be like God? You know, they, some people believe he was the light bearer of God because he's referred to as, as Lucifer. Um, he, he carried the, the, the light of God, but also he was so close to the light of God, you know, maybe he started thinking he could be that light, right? And, and that was one of his downfalls. First Kings 6.23, so we see here that cherubims have two wings, right? And within the oracle, he made two cherubims of olive tree and each 10 cubits high. So this is the temple that uh, Solomon built. And five cubits was the one wing of the cherub and five cubits the other wing of the cherub from the uttermost part of the one wing unto the uttermost part of the other were 10 cubits across. And the other cherub was 10 cubits. Both the cherubims were of one measure and one size. So these are different. This is not the mercy seat. These are just these decorations within the temple. And these cherubims are not like this, covering the mercy seat, facing one another. These cherubims are standing this way, right? And he said, he set the cherubims within the inner house and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubims so that the wing of the one touched the wing of the, of, of the one wall and the wing of the other cherubim touched the other wall and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. So you can imagine these two cherubims with their wings stretched out, stretched across. And he overlaid the cherubims with gold. Revelation 4, 6. Now, I just thought it'd be interesting as well to go to these other heavenly creatures. So we've got angels, which are ministering spirits. Obviously, man was created. We've got the cherubims, but then we have the seraphims as well. So what are the seraphims? They're these uh, heavenly beings that have six wings. Now, I'll go to Revelation 4 first because I... I believe that these creatures, these four bees, are seraphims, right? Because it's just it's very uh, strong similarities. But let's read here from verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. I remember reading this book that somebody gave me. It was sort of like somebody that had uh, put pictures to the book of Revelation. So it wasn't the King James Version. But you sort of read through this book and you're just reading through passages, but an artist had actually like created all this imagery for the book of revelation and i just remember the the beasts that were full of eyes it's like it's like kind of freaky because it's just like this figure there and he's just like got eyes all over himself but um have you guys ever heard of this thing called the google dream i don't know if you guys because you know google's got all this machine learning now you go 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 google it if you uh, funny enough you go go look it up i right, go google it this google dream because you know google's got the pixel now and it's getting into all these images and it's trying to machine learn. So that's why, you know, when you take a picture on Facebook, or you take a picture on Google, it just recognizes you instantly, right? Because Google has all these images that it's all saved up and, and its computers are constantly analyzing it and it's just looking at all these things. So what they, what they did is this algorithm that where you can go through like what's called the Google dream and it just like goes through all, and it's basically a pictorial view of how this computer analyzes all this data and all, all these pictures. And I, I, can't, I don't know what the base of their data was, but because they, they did it on like pictures of dogs or something like that, and because dogs have like eyes that are similar, uh, they, like they all have eyes and stuff like that, they started getting like all these weird pictures of paintings, but it was just made of like eyes and made of like dogs. It was just kind of like, kind of freaky. <laughs> Anyways, when I think of like these beasts that are full of eyes, I kind of think of that Google dream that this, this guy at work was telling me about. So I went to go check it out. Um, I think it's called Google Deep Dream. If you want to go check it out and, and, and see what they're doing and, and all the machine learning that's happening now. 
And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So sometimes I wonder, you know, is it because these creatures were created after the animals, or is it that animals were created as like parts of these be like beasts? You know, maybe these creatures already existed, and then when God created animals, he kind of took parts of them and, 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 and made separate animals, and that's why they look like animals. Um, Revelation 4, 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And, they, and look at this. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, I don't know if you think you realize that about these beasts, but isn't that like just a crazy task that these guys have when you think about it? They do not sleep day or night, and all they do is praise God, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. I think because us in the flesh, you know, we kind of get tired and whatnot. We just think, how can they just do this 24-7 for all eternity? But there are creatures in heaven that do this, and I'm sure they're glad to do that. And I'm sure if you were there too, you'd be glad to do it because God is so great and glorious. But one thing I was wondering about this passage was, do you think that they're just constantly saying it again and again and again over and over 24-7? Um, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's what it's saying when it says they rest not day nor night. Like probably they don't rest and they're always praising God. But I don't think that that means they're just constantly repeating it again and again and again. And the reason is because when we go to Isaiah, I'll show you here, we're seeing the seraphims. And uh, let's read here in Isaiah 6.1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So Isaiah has this vision in heaven, right, where we are in Revelation, right, seeing these, I believe, these same creatures. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. So I think it's just kind of a bit of a coincidence, right, if these are not the same creatures, that seraphims have six wings and the four beasts in Revelation have six wings as well. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So you see they've got six wings. Two of them are covering their faces, two of them are covering their feet, and two of them they're flying with. And look, and here's why I think I don't think that they're all just saying holy, holy, holy all together all at the same time, 24-7. Because it says here, and one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So it's kind of like they're praising God and they're shouting to each other. Maybe they're taking turns talking. But then it says here, we go to Isaiah. Then said I, woe is me for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And look here in verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then said I, Here am I send me that's a that's a great passage there but i want to just focus there on verse six where it says then flew one of the seraphims unto me so this is why i don't think they're just praising god again and again 24 7 because obviously this seraphim had to take a break right to go and get this coal and touch isaiah's tongue with it so uh, you know i'm sure there's there's a bit of spaces there between them so satan is not an angel Right? I don't believe he's an angel. I believe he's a cherubim. And I believe he was one of the cherubims that was on either side of the mercy seat. That's why he was the anointed cherub that covereth. Let's look at a couple of other passages where we see what else is Satan like. We can get to learn a bit more about Satan's character. Let's look at the temptation of Christ. This is when Christ, after he was baptized, he was driven of the Spirit into the wilderness and he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. We fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was tempted of the devil. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward and hungered. So we see here that Satan, he's an expert at temptation, isn't he? That's why he's so good at getting people to sin and getting people to get carried away with the flesh and whatnot. He's got all these skills and, and just wisdom where he can do this. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So we can see here the temptation 
And we can see here Jesus' response. And we can learn from that what Jesus was being tempted with, right? And I believe the first temptation was to tempt Jesus to not trust God alone, right? That, that he was trusting God, fasting in the wilderness, and he's saying, hey, you know, you can't trust God to get you through this. Just make some bread, right? And every time it's interesting that Jesus responds with the word of God. I mean, Jesus was God in the flesh, but he's giving us this example here. How do we fight Satan? We fight Satan with God's word. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. So we see here that Satan has immense authority in this world where he can take Jesus up to this mountain, show him all the kingdoms of the world, and say, you know what? I will give you authority all over this if you will just worship me. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. So not only does the devil have a lot of authority in this world, but look at this, he desires worship, doesn't he? He was willing to give it all over to Jesus just to be worshipped by God in the flesh. So he, that's why he has religions, because he desires worship. He wants people to worship him, because he wants to be like God, because God desires worship too. It's just that it's a sin for Satan to do it, because he is not worthy of worship. He is not God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So what I want to show you here is, you see how now Satan is quoting the Bible. It's because Satan knows the Bible as well. That's why it's not just because somebody is doing miracles and somebody knows the Bible really well that they are of God, right? Because if they're preaching a false gospel, for example, you need to, to judge what they're preaching by the word of God. Because why? Satan can do miracles. Satan has workers. And Satan also knows the word of God, right? He knows how to twist the word of God. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. So we see here that Satan, we, we learn some more about his character in the temptation of Jesus. We see here that he has authority in this world. Revelation 2, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. So remember we talked about Satan not being omnipresent? He has a location. And what's interesting about Revelation 2 in, in the church in Pergamos, it's almost like he has a headquarters. Right? Like he has somewhere that he operates out of. Now, was it Pergamos in those days? And who knows where it was later on? Is now, is it the UN? Is it the United States? I don't know. Like, is it somewhere where it's like the, the, the central working of Satan's kingdom and where he spills out all this filth? Maybe it is the United States. Maybe it's, maybe it's there because that's where all the Hollywood stuff is coming out from and all the merchandise and everything like that. Who knows? But it's interesting that it's almost like he has this this place where he operates from, even where Satan's seat is. So that's where he actually sits, right? Because if it's his seat, that's where he's actually sitting. He's in that location. And thou holdest fast my name, has not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Matthew 12 says here, And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then, how shall then his kingdom stand? So not only does he have this base of operations, he's also this leader of this great kingdom, doesn't he? He has this kingdom and people that work for him, people and angels. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, I believe talking about Satan here, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, another thing we have to think about with Satan is that he appears as good, not bad. 
And this is something really important, especially for children, right? Because children watch these cartoons, they watch these movies, and when you look at Satan, how is he always pictured, right? He's always pictured as this guy in a red suit with a pitchfork, and he's, you know, he's ruling in hell, and, he's, and it's so obvious that he's Satan. You know, when you, when you watch this movie and you think, who's Satan? Oh, he's the evil red guy, right? That's, you know, that, that looks evil and looks dark. That's not, what I, that's not what Satan looks like. That's not how he appears to the world. The Bible says here in 2 Corinthians 11, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So you see, even false teachers and false apostles, they appear as people that are following Jesus Christ. Right? Some of them even have deceived themselves into thinking they are. They're the ones that are going to be saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then Jesus, what? He'll profess them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. it says here, no marvel. So he's saying, hey, don't be shocked because false apostles are trying to deceive you into thinking they're apostles of Christ. Don't be shocked for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So you see here that Satan doesn't appear as Satan, as a dragon, as a serpent. No, when he tries to deceive the world, he's going to come across as righteous. He's going to come across as an angel of, of light. So it's not just because somebody looks clean, somebody looks righteous, that they are of God. Right? We test it by the Spirit, transformed into an angel of light. So see here that he's not an angel. Right? That's another reason why people think he's an angel. He says, that they think, oh, he's an angel of light. No, he's transformed into an angel of light, right? So there must be the ability for a cherubim to shapeshift somehow, right? To change their form so that they can appear as an angel of light. They have this supernatural ability. Verse 15, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Matthew seven fifteen. Even talking about false prophets here, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So these false prophets that teach false things, you know, like a lot of them on the, on the, uh, out there, like, you know, Joyce Myers and Joel Osteen, these big names that you hear about, right, that are preaching a false gospel, they don't look satanic, do they? What we think of satanic, they don't look e like evil, they look clean cut, they look very presentable. They, they're wearing their suits. They look very clean because Satan knows he's not, he's not coming. It, it's not a wolf in wolf's clothing, right? It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. They're trying to look like Christians in order to deceive the flock. Revelation 2.24 But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So even though he appears as light, he appears as ministers of righteousness. He appears as an angel of light. People that start getting into the occult and actually following Satan, the people that are fully into it, they go into the depths of Satan. It gets really dark and really sinful. And it's not even something that we even want to touch because it'll destroy your life, obviously. Now, what's another characteristic? I'll just get through these and then we'll, we'll finish on this point. Um, where am I up to? Yeah, I think that's it. So we'll just get through this one and then, we'll, and then we'll stop here. The last one is that Satan, he has a religion. Now, we talked about Satan being a religious creature. He has sanctuaries. But what's interesting here that there is, there is a certain religion that is mentioned that is called the synagogue of Satan. Uh, Revelation 2.9, it says here, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy, look at this, of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, if you're wondering what religion it is, I mean, who out there is calling themselves Jews, but are not following Jesus Christ, are not really the spiritual Jews, and they have synagogues? It's the religion of Judaism. Right? So the religion of Judaism is this main religion that Satan is heading up. That's his religion. They say they, they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Revelation 3.9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, Right, these Judaizers, these Jews, and it's not talking about the race, obviously, it's the religion, which say they are Jews and are not, 
So who in this world is even calling themselves a Jew? There's only one group of people that's even saying they're Jews. And the Bible's saying here, there are people calling themselves Jews and they're not really Jews. But they are the synagogue of Satan. But do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. And you know, something that's really interesting is because you know, a lot of people think that the rich, you know, the Hollywood and all that, you know, a lot of the people believe that behind that is, uh, are all the Jews, right? There's a lot of Jews behind that that are making that happen, making all these evil things, you know, behind the porn industry, behind the movie industry and whatnot. And a lot of them are trying to rule the world in the background, aren't they? Isn't it funny that, you know, these, these wicked people in the background want everyone to, to serve them and worship them and they want to rule the world. And it's interesting here that God is saying here, hey, you know these people that say they are Jews and are not really Jews and they're on the synagogue of Satan? He says, hey, you know what? I'm going to make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Isn't that interesting? That, you know, when we are in our glorified bodies, God is actually going to get these false Jews to come and worship at our feet. How he's going to turn the tables. Romans 2.25. So who is a true Jew? It says here in Romans 2, for, for circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the circum uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? So basically saying, hey, circumcision only matters if you're actually keeping the whole law. If you don't keep the whole law, you're basically uncircumcised. And if somebody who's uncircumcised keeps the whole law, shouldn't they be counted as somebody who is circumcised? So you see, circumcision is not what makes you a Jew. Romans 2.28 for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. So it's not the fact that you are circumcised outwardly. It says, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So who are the real Jews? The real Jews are not ones that are circumcised outwardly. The real Jews are the ones that are circumcised inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart so what does that mean when you're circumcised in the heart well we read in colossians 2 and ye are complete in him we're complete in jesus christ which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of christ so you see when we believe on jesus christ we are complete in christ Christ was circumcised, and that's why we are also circumcised in that sense. So the circumcision without hands is the circumcision of the heart. That's why anyone that believes on Jesus Christ is technically a Jew, right? We're the ones that are circumcised in the heart. We are the Jews that are one inwardly, and it's the ones that are circumcised outwardly, claiming to be Jews. They are not the true Jews. Now let's end on Philippians 3.1 because we see here another passage where we are the circumcision, those that believe, not the ones that are cut just on the outside. Philippians 3.1, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you to me is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So he's saying here, I want to warn you again of these people. It's not grievous for me to do this. It's safe for you. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers beware of the concision now what does the word concision mean if you think of an incision like to cut in a surgery con is like with right so the idea is it's the people that have the cut now they're with the incision right so he's referring there to people that are physically circumcised because then he contrasts it with verse 3 where he says for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So we ought to be aware of the agenda of these so-called Jews, right? These people that are uh, just Jews by name, but they are not truly Jews. They just have the cut. They just concisioned, right? But they're not circumcised. Uh, verse four, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he have whereof to, uh, where he might trust in the flesh, 
I am all. So you see, you see how he's saying here, it's not just being physically cut. Hey, we're the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. And he says, hey, if it was about being circumcised physically, Paul is saying here, hey, I have whereof more to glory, right? Because he actually is circumcised. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews. So you see, he was actually a physical Jew, uh, but he's also a spiritual Jew. As touching the law of Pharisee, Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. And, and this passage really has nothing to do with what I'm preaching about, but I just want to read this because I, I love this passage so much. It says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I am suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So he's saying, I want to do this because I'm striving for perfection. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, so I'm not there yet, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He says, I want to reach what reached me. You know, God was perfect. That's what came for me. I'm going for that. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I just feel like when you read this passage, you can just see like Paul's desire, his, his desire to want to know God, to want to follow God. And sometimes I just think of ourselves and just, we're just so content. We're just being mediocre. We're just so content. We're just, we're just getting by with the minimum. We just think, oh, have I, you know, don't I go soul winning enough? Don't I go with church enough? Don't I go to church enough? Haven't I read the Bible enough? We're always striving to do the minimum. When you read a passage like this, you see Paul's heart and you just see how much he's just trying to strive for God. He loves Christ so much that he's constantly striving for the mark, for the prize of the high calling. And you know what? If we want to defeat Satan, if we want to win this... Oh, sorry, I just choked on my slide. If we want to win this spiritual battle, hey, you know what? We're going to have to have that heart. We're going to have to fight like Paul was willing to fight and, do, and follow after the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Anyways, we'll end it there. Um, there's still a lot uh, to talk about with Satan and I'm sort of getting off on different topics, but I hope you're learning a lot on the way. Um, but let's, let's pray and then we'll continue next week. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. I just thank you, Lord, for the zeal of Paul. Um, Lord, uh, he, he would know what it's like to go um, you know, head to head against Satan and, and his forces. So I pray, Lord, if we desire to defeat uh, the, the, and win this fight, win this spiritual fight where we are, I pray, Lord, that we would have this zeal, that, Lord, we would be striving for the prize of the high calling and we would press towards that mark. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us ignorant of Satan's devices, that we can learn a lot about him. And I pray, Lord, as we learn more, that we would not have this false image of Satan and false image of, of what he's capable of. But Lord, we, we take heed to what he can do, Lord, and we take this spiritual fight seriously. We thank you and we, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.